Uh, we have been talking as well about Dominic Cummings and the COVID inquiry, of course. Uh, and on Tuesday, uh, the COVID inquiry heard evidence from two of Boris Johnson's key advisers at the heart of the height of the pandemic and at the heart of it as well. Dominic Cummings, former chief advisor to the then Prime Minister, he said uh, that a dysfunctional system led vulnerable groups to be appallingly neglected in March 2020, adding that senior people themselves didn't know who on earth was in charge of what. Have a listen to this. It was a mix of a lot of the wrong people in the wrong job, uh, um, decades of accumulated power, no real scrutiny and insight, a culture of um, constantly classifying everything to uh, hide mistakes and um, hide scrutiny. Uh, management was bad, incredibly bloated with uh, so many senior figures that, that, that they themselves, as Helen McNamara's statement makes clear, the senior people themselves didn't know who, who on earth was in charge of what. And that was the clean version, by the way, because for those of you who were listening to some of it yesterday, uh, it got a bit fruity at times. Um, not only useless was a word that he described many cabinet ministers, but uh, many words we could not repeat here uh, on the television. Uh, but let's talk now to Deputy Comment Editor at The Telegraph, Ms Annabel Denham. Annabel, very good afternoon to you. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mike. Now, I mean, I think you and I probably could have surmised that things were not going as well as they should have been inside of Downing Street during that terrible period uh, of the COVID pandemic. But I don't think we quite realised how much vitriol perhaps was going around, um, uh, mostly emanating from Dominic Cummings, but from all of the kind of, you know, very macho kind of world in which they inhabited, where just, you know, hurling insults at people, swearing at people, talking about each other behind their backs. I mean, it was worse than, than schoolyard politics, wasn't it? It was pretty ghastly language and attitudes and behaviours that we saw uh, going right up to the top to Boris Johnson's most senior aide during the pandemic. Look, like you say, Mike, I wasn't especially surprised by anything that I heard this week at the COVID inquiry. I'm not sure that the government at any stage gave us the impression that the situation was under control. It was quite clear that there was dysfunction and that there was chaos um, and that the government machine simply was not functioning properly. Now, aside from the accusations of misogyny and the crass and inappropriate language that Dominic Cummings was clearly using, I do think that there was value in his appearance, the evidence that he gave to the inquiry yesterday in terms of creating perhaps a clearer picture of what the culture and the structures were were in government, which allowed the behaviours that we saw and the behaviour patterns that we saw during the pandemic to perhaps go unchecked. Some insight is why it was that impromptu WhatsApps were being used to make crucial decisions rather than more full processes that you would expect from the highest level of government's, uh, government during an emergency. But my concern with the COVID inquiry is and has always been that it will not un ultimately answer the most important question, which is whether lockdown was an appropriate measure for a pandemic for a disease with the fatality rate of the coronavirus. And it seems to me that Baroness Hallett and the lead council have already reached some kind of conclusion that lockdown was necessary, that we needed that blunt authoritarian tool. And it's really just a question of timings of how the decisions were made and perhaps why we didn't lock down soon enough, why we didn't lock down hard enough, why we didn't lock down for long enough. And that's very concerning because the next time the pand a pandemic reaches our shores, which by the way, will probably be before this inquiry has even been wound up. No. We're not going to have learned any of the really crucial lessons. But isn't that the problem, though? Because you never can really be definitive about whether it was a good idea or not, because the people who make the arguments have a completely different point of view to each other. And so those who say, oh, well, it obviously didn't work because of this, then the defence will be, oh, yeah, but that's because it didn't start soon enough, it wasn't for long enough, it wasn't hard enough, and therefore that's why it didn't work. And others will say, um, when it didn't work at all, uh, they'll say, yeah, well, how much worse would it have been if we hadn't done it? So there's, literally, there's no way to reach the destination, if you like, uh, to judge whether it was right or wrong. I mean, I happen to think it was wrong. Uh, Boris Johnson's getting uh, an awful lot of flack in some of the papers this morning for saying, uh, is, why are we stopping everything? Why are we shutting everything down in order to save a few lives of some older people who might well die anyway? <laughs> 
Yes, I think that's right. I'm, I don't really agree with the criticisms actually that have been leveled against Boris Johnson. Undoubtedly, he was indecisive, but the idea that he changed his mind on a daily or even hourly basis as new information came in, I think that's to be welcomed. Mm. I would encourage our prime minister, our most senior ministers and civil servants to have a healthy scepticism when it comes to imposing very draconian restrictions and undermining basic democratic freedoms. And yet, you know, that, that seems to be something which ought to be criticised. But when it comes to the inquiry, I, I fear, just looking at the evidence that I've seen thus far, that when lockdown itself is challenged, that doesn't lead to a proper discussion in the inquiry. That's just noted. Mm. And the next line of questioning begins. And I worry that we're not uh, perhaps interviewing economists. In fact, economists have been completely sidelined over the last few years, unable to really give input into what the costs and benefits of lockdown might be. I mean, the inquiry ought to be designed to present us with a clearer, broader picture that brings in what we now know, which is, as I say, the economic impact, which has been absolutely devastating, the rampant inflation, the cost of living crisis, mm. the impact that it's had on young people, not just in terms of their education, but in terms of socialization, the challenges that so many young people are now facing, the massive increase in eating disorders and mental health illnesses, the hangover from furlough and the impact that that's had on attitudes to work mm. and so on and so forth. We know a lot more now than we did in March 20. 2020. And I think that we should give the government a little bit of slack. Hindsight is always 2020. No wonder they were perhaps flapping around and that there was a sense of chaos back at the start of the pandemic. It was completely unprecedented. But we need to learn lessons now based on the information that we currently have, in addition to learning from international best practice and why it was that Sweden didn't lock down. And yet it, the impact of the coronavirus was no more severe, really, than it was here in the UK mm. when you consider all of the factors. Which would suggest that the lockdown wasn't necessary, um, at least at that level, in any event. But also, the other problem, it seems to me, that we have here is that people were very willing to go along with the restrictions. You know, there were an awful lot of people who, much less like me, uh, were just willing to swallow what they were being told by the government. You know, we were questioning it an awful lot here when we were uh, doing shows uh, at Talk TV and Talk Radio. And we were asking questions and we were getting kind of castigated as if we were somehow doubters, as if we were somehow, you know, overly negative about what the government was doing. And it turns out we were right to be overly negative about what the government was doing because they didn't know what they were doing. That's right. And I think throughout the pandemic, we had the issue of the identifiable victim problem, which was that we knew how many people were contracting the virus. We knew how many people were in intensive care and indeed, unfortunately, how many people were dying from the virus. Yeah. But we were focusing solely on those individuals, on trying to prevent a single person from dying of coronavirus without considering the impact, the social impact, the economic impact, indeed, the health impact of consecutive lockdowns. Now, I happen to have been in favour of the first lockdown, given that our understanding of the virus and how it behaved at the time was very rudimentary. But the question ought to be asked over whether that lockdown went on for too long, why it was that schools opened on the continent, many countries on the continent, before they opened here. And Boris Johnson, as we now know from this week's testimonies and the evidence that has come out, was worried that he blinked too soon when it came to the second lockdown, that yeah. circuit breaker. Was that really necessary? And as, it, as for the third lockdown, the longest lockdown, again, did that drag on for too long? Did we need to delay Freedom Day? Are we going to answer these questions with this inquiry or is it just going to be an opportunity for character assassinations of those people who are working at the top of government? Is it an opportunity for the drama and the profanities, but actually not just asking that most basic and most important question? Well, that's, I think, my point, I suppose, which I, which I should have made slightly better, but you've just made it for me, is that, you know, surely we should be a bit more sceptical in the future, so that if there is, you know, information coming out of government, if they are going back to having those dreadful daily press conferences, rather than having questions from the media, which were laughably bad, uh, from the likes of Robert Peston uh, and from others, where they were just kind of trying to get bogged down into whether there was enough being done, whether more could be done. At no point did anybody actually ask the question if it, they weren't doing too much.
That's right. And of course, there's questions to be asked, very important questions to be asked about what the role of the opposition was yeah. here. Because anytime I saw Labour MPs go out on the media or speak in Parliament on the issue of lockdown, it was always to ask why the government had brought it in sooner right. or why it wasn't lasting for longer or whether the restriction could be tougher. And if you look at the devolved nations, certainly we yeah. saw evidence of uh, you know alacrity with which they might pull the most authoritarian levers. And these sorts of things need to be scrutinized because of course they placed additional pressure on the government when really their role would certainly the role of the opposition should have been to hold the government mm. to account and that was that was sorely lacking and to your point about our compliance like you mike i was very surprised that the, the british public was so willing to adhere to these rules but as the lockdown files showed earlier this year fear was being weaponized when you terrify people into their homes it's not altogether surprising mm. that they're going to stay there. Yeah, exactly right. So, I mean, you know, it's been a bit more interesting this week, I suppose, as, as a general principle, the COVID inquiry. But today, um, it's another senior official who's up. There's nothing much coming out of it. I mean, this is going to go on, as you say, for a very, very long time indeed. Um, and if anything, um, we really haven't learned much about what we didn't already suspect or know, have we? No, I don't think so. Like I said, some of what Dominic Cummings has said thus far, I have found useful. Um, I would like much closer scrutiny of the medical and scientific establishment and why they didn't step up and why they arrived at the consensus decisions that they did. And to the first phase of the coronavirus um, inquiry, which has already been wound up, you know, there's, there was a strong sense that we were fighting the last war, that we were prepared for an influenza pandemic, but not a coronavirus pandemic. And I want to ensure that we prevent making that decision again. So interested to know what the next steps there will be. But like I've said, I don't feel as though the impact on children, as though the impact on the economy, which is being felt now very painfully, is, is a significant enough contributing factor to this inquiry. And as you say, it's going to go on for years. It's going to cost hundreds of millions of pounds. Many other nations have already wound up their commissions looking into their pandemic responses. And there's a real concern that we're just simply not going to take anything forward that will be useful when another pandemic comes onto our shores. And my concern is that now that we've had a lockdown, subsequent lockdowns, that will be a lever that future politicians will grab for more enthusiastically than they did this time. Let's not forget, it wasn't until Italy imposed a lockdown that politicians and their advisors here believed it was possible in the UK. They had seen it happen in Wuhan. They had seen the Chinese response, viewed it as extremely authoritarian and assumed they wouldn't be able to impose it on the British public. Well, it turned out that they could. Yeah. And that mustn't mean that the next time we have another emergency, another crisis, they do so without having a more thorough rather than less thorough impact assessment and cost benefit analysis yeah exactly right um let's turn to the middle classes um i mean people would say sometimes it's the middle classes that run the country um tory interns are being told to undergo privileged walks according to a piece in your paper today to show advantages of being white and middle class Seems like a ridiculous idea, but I also note from your paper this morning uh, as well, Annabelle, that middle classes are now working the longest than any other cohort of society um, amid a surge of economic inactivity, um, working later into life, wait, working later into retirement um, and sharing less average wealth than ever. That's right. So it's finding that wealthier people are able to retire earlier simply because they're uh, they can afford to whereas the those of lower incomes are retiring earlier perhaps because of sickness because they for some reason or another need to become economically inactive and actually it's the middle classes who are powering through um and into retirement into those older years in order to keep earning obviously keep contributing to the uk economy and that ought to be commended but at the same time we should bear in mind uh, research from Civitas earlier this year, which found that an increasing number of middle class 
people in the UK are actually net beneficiaries from the state. So the amount that they are receiving through benefits exceeds the amount that they're paying in taxes. And that's extremely problematic. I mean, look, Mike, we talked about this before, but fundamentally, the British economy is broken now. We have very high levels of uh, economic inactivity, with high numbers of people who are on sickness benefit. We have an NHS who's unable to treat those people. Indeed, people within the NHS, staff within the NHS, unable to turn up for work because they themselves are ill. We have a highly regulated la labour market, which is making it less and less uh, sort of uh, attractive for employers to take on workers. We've got taxes and the set to reach their highest level in seven decades, worsening public services. Um, it, things are simply getting worse and worse. And a concern that I have is that the, we've, we've got this squeezed middle who are becoming less and less incentivized to work. So, you know, it is, it is reassuring to learn that they are, they are working later in life, but we need to address why it is perhaps that those of lower income are unable to, and ways in which we might be able to encourage wealthier members of the society to participate in the economy for longer, perhaps yeah. by loosening some of the rules around self-employment. Well, that would be nice. It would be very good to see. But I fear that there's not going to be much comfort coming next week in the uh, autumn statement. Do you think there's any good news coming there? Well, it's a really interesting one because over the last couple of weeks, we've seen Jeremy Hunt come under increasing pressure. There's a lot of speculation that he's going to be replaced, it, not after the autumn statement, perhaps not even after the budget in the spring. But after that, there's a sense that he is unable to inspire voters, that he's not going to be offering them anything that will get them to the ballot box and voting conservative. And there's now speculation that perhaps he's going to pull some kind of rabbit out of the hat at the autumn statement statement. Now, he's going to be very reluctant to uh, cut taxes, uh, personal taxes that he feels would be an inflationary move, but he may cut something like inheritance tax or stamp duty, both of which I would be supportive of. Inheritance tax, to me, is a terrible, immoral uh, tax. I find it ultimately grotesque that people who pay tax throughout their lives are then taxed in death, mm. while stamp duty further distorts the housing market. And we have a housing requirement crisis in this country. So both of those would be welcome. But whether the Chancellor feels that now is the time that he can slash taxes, I'm not so sure. I wonder if he might wait until the March budget. Yeah. I wonder if that may be closer enough to the election for him as well. Annabel, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Annabel Denham.